And then all of a sudden, this overwhelming fear, sadness, a real burning sensation in my gut would just come out of nowhere. G'day, and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today, we are talking with Graham Studholtz, someone who has a complex PTSD journey. Complex PTSD is considered to be a more severe form of PTSD and is commonly developed following trauma in childhood. Graham's trauma occurred within the first few months of his life when his mother tried to drown him. Because of this event, he had the same reoccurring nightmare for the next 60 years and lived his entire life unaware of his PTSD until he was diagnosed in the 1990s. But it has only been in the last 18 months that Graham has been able to manage his complex PTSD due to undertaking innovative psychedelic treatment. Hello Graham, and welcome to Wellbeing. Thank you for having me on the show. Before we begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Graham? Uh, well, I'm 65 years old, um, currently living up in the Northern Rivers, and had a very, very frustrating life until about 15, 16 months ago when I discovered um, the psychedelic medicines, I suppose, MDMA in particular. What has been your experience with traumatic experiences? Well, what happened with me was, um, I suppose my saving grace was I didn't know any different because the trauma happened you know, in the first few months of my life. Uh, my mother tried to kill me. She had postnatal depression and she tried on numerous occasions to drown me, suffocate me. Mm. And I knew something, but I didn't fully understand. And I had all this sort of darkness in the background. And, you know, when I tried to ask questions, I was always told, you know, you were loved and, you know, rah, rah, rah. But I could never um, sort of bridge this gap of this real dark, ugly stuff that was inside me. Mm. And, you know, this is sort of like I felt there was something wrong with me. And uh, um, over the course of my life, uh, you know, this stuff just got stronger and stronger mm. and stronger. I tried everything. I work, I work as a therapist. And in my journey of learning this and doing this, you know, I've done a lot of uh, different things, different modalities and whatever. And, you know, I was making, I was making progress, but I couldn't crack the code of that mm. uh, PTSD stuff like there was a terror inside of me and the terror came out in intimacy you know in a loving whether it's with my ex-wife kids uh I've now got grandkids um, I'm in a 20-year relationship with Annette and uh, this this stuff comes out in the most inopportune way in and it's just sort of like running into a brick wall um you know in any intimate loving uh moments and also any moments that come where I'm actually really enjoying myself uh, it's a, it's it's like self-sabotage on on steroids and my experience of coming to terms with this trauma is that uh you know it was was totally invalidated uh you know, i remember talking to one therapist psychologist and her response was oh my mother wouldn't do that and um yeah that that's the sort of thing that i've grown up with uh with this um stuff i suppose for the one of a better word and i didn't know the full extent of you know what complex pdsd was you know i thought that was something that you know that other people had like depression and anxiety and once i started to um, make inroads in this when I started the psychedelic journey, I all of a sudden started to realise just how extensive uh, my own uh, background wounding was. And uh, I think the big the big thing for me was that I didn't know any different. Like, I, this happened so early in my life. I grew up and I developed coping mechanisms to survive and live with this stuff. Um, and some of them were quite unhealthy. And it was something that I could never sort of, um, uh, sort of come to terms with, I suppose. And, you know, that that's why when psychedelic, when I first heard about it and uh, with my partner, Annette, she, her father was a pedophile. And, mm. you know, we now realise that in, the, in, the, in our journey is this is what brought us together was our wounding. Um, but also, too, the, the, the authentic and genuine self that was on the other side of the wounding. But we couldn't connect with it. And I know in our relationship we had a lot of... Um, trouble trying to connect with ourselves but also with each other and um, she she started the, the psychedelic journey a few months before I did and I was just so over it, reluctant I wasn't going to go there, I was sick and tired I'd actually given up um, mm. I thought yeah, nothing's ever worked and, and they tried um, MDMA sessions and when I talk about using the psychedelics I'm talking about a properly run session where that is the focus of the session with intention and you know goals and also mm. uh, you know it's sort of like the backup 
backup therapy as well. So it's not just sort of sit down yep. and take the yep. drug. It's not that. Um, the actual medication is only around probably a, 30, a third, third of the process, 30% of the process. Um, the actual setting, the intention and the afterwards, the backup is is the most important part of it. So it's not just simply lie down, take a tablet and mm. you know, wait for it mm. to happen. Um, there's a whole lot more that goes to it. And, um, and I found that uh, the... Um, uh, particularly with MDMA, the MDMA really un- unlocks the door um, into what my PTSD was all about. And I found that the, the medication opened the door, but I still had to walk through that door. I still had to integrate mm. and, and sort of connect with and understand and, and bring it back to myself what actually really happened. Um, but in the process with the psychedelic, uh, particularly MDMA and psilocybin, which is the magic mushrooms, um, those two complement each other very, very well. And my, my therapist was able to uh, advise me on which way to go ultimately was my choice. And, um, you know, and I chose to go down just using the MDMA at the beginning um the first three four sessions and then we talked about introducing psilocybin and how that works because you know like the um the depth of my depression also was coming out and again look i had no idea this was this was my normal Mm. and i think that's probably why i survived um but as soon as i started to take the lid off this stuff it really started to hit me how um significant my trauma was and how inadequate um you know the basic trauma uh therapy was and you know and i can now i now understand why uh you know like mainstream therapy uh has about a five percent success rate with you know the really mm. hardcore complex ptsd and i can i understand why and i can see why because my defense mechanisms or my protection that i put in place to survive my mother um is you know it's 65 years later i'm still actually starting to chip away at those um, blocks, but not blowing them out of the water, but just in a gradual way. And that's the beauty of the psychedelic medicine is that it does it in a way that um, uh, I can handle. It's not going to um, blow me out of the water or re-traumatize. And the the beauty of the medicine was that I could go back into and face my trauma, but not from being re-traumatized, but it was from like Mm -hmm. an observer being outside and saying, okay, that's what, okay, that really makes sense. And then example was I had um, the same reoccurring nightmare for probably 60 years and it's only in the last few years that it's actually stopped happened and stopped happening and what I'd noticed about two or three years ago before I started the medication when the nightmare came in I'd stop no and I'd wake up and when I was in the, the medication and this was both psilocybin and MDMA in that session I actually came to terms with what my nightmare was all about and it was being held underwater by the throat um, and looking up through the water and seeing my mother and mm. I'd had nightmares, reoccurring nightmares my whole life from that and once I'd actually connected with it um, during the, 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 the session uh, that's you know, that's the end of it. There's no fear. There's no um, judgment or uh, anything about it. It's like it's gone, totally gone. And what I find about the trauma um, of those, those initial acts with mum, um, 100% remission. It's gone, totally gone. It's no longer controlling me or uh, influencing my day-to-day stuff. I've still got to do stuff to do around the depression and the anxiety that came out of um, all of that stuff, like it accumulated mm. and it got to the point where, you know, I was just losing losing function and um, it was quite a scary thing because I didn't know what I didn't know. And since I've been using the medication, um, it's it's got to a point now where I know what it is that was there and I've come to terms with what it is and it no longer has control over me. And the last thing that I've, I've got to deal with is uh, is the anxiety of all of those things that happened. And they're really, uh, it's a really deeply ingrained sort of sense of anger, anxiety. And I think the first time that I recognised I had anxiety, I had a panic attack after I had the COVID, first COVID vaccine, mm. second COVID vaccine. I had a, a, a panic attack and oh, I really panicked. My heart was racing. So I went down to the, went back to the clinic and oh, they put me in there and lights and bells and whistles and cords and plugs and switch everything on and, and I'm just sitting there and you know I, I felt normal um, 
And then all of a sudden it just hit me. I've just had a panic attack. And I talked to the, the, the nurse about it and, and said, this, I think this is what I've just actually happened. And we talked about it and she said, yeah, that's probably what it was. And, you know, and I apologised. I apologised to the staff and the doctors and whatever and felt quite embarrassed. But what I realised was that you know, that's the anxiety. That's the extent and the, the, extent and the, the depth of the anxiety that I'm car- carrying. Mm. And that there are certain things that trigger me that, 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 that came out. And that um, COVID exam was was a good one and what I was able to do with that was to actually look at how do I deal with with my anxiety and this is where um, the CBD oil um, the cannabis oil has been absolutely brilliant it's something that's very soft very gentle and uh, I use the drops because I can't smoke uh, I just 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 physically can't smoke I just mm. just cough myself to death and uh, with the the CBD drops which I was advised to, to try and all, every step of the way through this process, I've talked with my therapist, I've talked with my GP, told them what I'm doing, and you know they've been fascinated. They've asked heaps of questions, and every time I go back for a checkup, which I do regularly, even though I don't need it, I still go back. Um, and I've told them and talked about what I'm doing, and they've given me insights from their perspective, and uh, it's been very, very, um, very helpful, very useful. It's been a, a really steep learning curve for me. I come from a you know a rural background and probably as, as conservative as it's possibly to, to be and now you know here I am talking on radio about <laughs> using uh, you know psychedelics mm. it's sort of like well hang on what's, what's happened but the bottom line is that it works it's amazing um, I can't speak highly enough of the um, the process and again I've got to stress it's not just the the, the drug it's the process it's 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 the, the setting the intention it's having the space like a session an MDMA May or psilocybin session lasts about six hours. It's not a it's not a small thing. It's not something you can go in, take the tablet, and an hour later you walk out. Um, you go in, you sit down, you center. I sit down, I center, talk to the therapist. What's happening? What am I looking for? What's my intentions? Take the medication, and it's usually and they're only micro doses. Like you know, it's just a really really small amount. Mm-hmm. And once I start to feel like because I know what it feels like a therapist will ask me okay how are you traveling whereabouts on the scale are you and I'll say okay do you want to have a top up um, and I'll say you know sometimes I'll say yes most of the time I say no I'm where I need to be I can feel the trauma coming up and and it's just connecting with the trauma and the way that my body has bled the trauma off is it shape tremors and I think in the, the, all the sessions that I've done, I think I'm up to about 100 hours of just, just tremoring, not doing anything else, just lying down and just tremoring and tremoring the trauma that my body has held for 60, nearly 65 years, tremoring that trauma out and just feeling the elation and whatever. And it, it, it's amazing how the process works. Like tremoring is it, tremoring, trauma out is a very natural process, but because of our conditioning and culture and whatever, it's something that we're with the, that, that we neglect and since um, you know I've had this experience myself uh, about 18 months ago um, I've now seen this in you know some of our clients um, you know when we're dealing with some of the, their trauma uh, how and being able to actually really just validate that and go into that place with them without traumatizing but actually just sort of like holding their hand and saying hey hang on this is this is really really important let's just try this for a couple of moments and see what you feel like and without exception they've really appreciated the guidance and being able to be held in it and supported that. So it's a very satisfying process, um, not only in just what it's done for me, but also to be able to take that into, uh, you know, what other other people are actually doing. It's, it's, it's really changed my uh, outlook on dealing with trauma, dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety. Um, it's something that uh, I think is just so, so, so important. And, and I mean, all this study and whatever was done 50, 60, 70 years ago, and then when the war, the war on drugs arrived, uh, everything, and I mean everything, just got thrown out the window. And it was just stop these drugs are now you know, illegal. And I know I'm breaking the law by using it, but geez, I'd rather be in a physical jail than stay in that mental jail that I was in. Um, to me, there was just no, you know, just no choice. Um, it, you know, I was just just amazed at how it, it's worked. It's life changing, life changing in a way that I never ever um, expected. You're listening to Wellbeing a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Graham Studholtz, who is sharing his journey with complex PTSD. 
what was the first moment that you became aware of like the PTSD? Like you had the language to say, like, cause you mentioned that that was the norm for you feeling like that. When was the point in time where you kind of could have the language and say, right, I kind of know what's going on here. I first, I was diagnosed back in the nineties, uh, probably about 97, 98, I think I was diagnosed back then. And I just totally shut it down, locked it down and just, you know, screwed it down real tight. Um, I've done a lot of work, a lot of personal development work, a lot of training, a lot of qualifications, experience. Um, and when the COVID thing hit, my partner and I decided, okay, let's just step back from our business. We run retreats and workshops and stuff. Let's just step back from that and do our own stuff. And I was in a place where I was trying to connect with what it is that, you know, I didn't know what it was. And I'd actually given up. Um, I'd actually said, okay. Uh, you know, look, I've, I've given up. I can't, I don't know what it is. I don't know what I don't know. I just can't do this. And I'm just, you know, I was just sort of running on, basically running on empty. Um, mm. Not not very happy, not satisfied with what I'm doing and not doing what I want to do either. So I'd sort of given into it. And I think the fact that, you know, living, living with Annette, um, she started doing her stuff and got onto this. And then she was at me for probably three or four months, five months, um, from her experience in using the psychedelics before I actually relented. And I actually went with her to one of her sessions. We spoke to the therapist, can I come? And, you know, and he said, yeah, 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 no worries. And um, that was my introduction. And even when I went to that session, it was three more sessions. And these sessions are six hours. Mm. Um, it was three more of those sessions before I got to the point where I could actually trust trust the process, trust the space, trust the medicine. And once I'd made that decision to trust, um, I didn't know what I didn't know and I didn't know, you know, any different. And, you know, I thought, but I can't stay like this. So it was like a catch-22. Um, and I just made the decision, right, oh, I'm going to do this. And uh, the, fourth to see, the fourth session that I did uh, was the one where we had combined, the first one where I combined it with psilocybin. And that really gave me a picture of what had actually happened, um, the psilocybin, and gives the body-held memory that the MDMA unlocks. The psilocybin actually gave it a picture. So I had images that were stored in my body that I actually trusted. And those images were based on facts or things that had happened in my life or things that were said that, that I actually knew outside the space. And what the psychedelics did was it actually gave me a context to connect with what I was carrying and what was going on. And, you know, when I first started to connect with the, the terror, uh, you know, like there's this infant that was living in fear of his life constantly for months and months on end. And that fear was held in the body like I had no cognitive ab abilities to mm. deal with it I had no cognitive memories or anything like that but this actual physical trauma was the terror was still being held in the body and what the medication did was allowed me to actually connect with it my way and have an image that helped um, my understanding of what it was so I could actually deal with it so when it comes to, to, you know, to answering a question at what point it was not a point um, I resisted I fought I hung on for grim death right down to the you know the beginning of the fourth session and um, and that was about a year ago so there was not a point where I said um, uh, I've got to do this I, I had given up I just I tried everything I'd got nowhere I'd made inroads but I couldn't get to the actual seat of it and I found that the the medication in the the in the the, the, the ritual space um, and it, it you know it, it worked it was absolutely brilliant I can't speak highly enough of um, my experience with this um, will I use it again probably not um, it's not the sort of thing I can't understand, I can't understand why people do it recreationally uh, I really don't get that um, mm. but I found that this is this is a, a medication um, and that it is done in the right circumstances it's very very powerful and it really works and when I'm talking about the dose rates they're called micro doses which is only probably a very small fraction of what you know people mm. consume mm. I, I don't know I've never I've never done it but um, the micro doses um, combined with the the setting and the intention and being in a therapy space and just staying there and there's nothing else to do just lie down and just just wait just breathe and just wait and just wait for the medicine um, to unlock the door but again 
you know, I've got to choose to walk through that door. And because I was so over it, um, once I'd made the decision to walk through that door, which was the beginning of the fourth session, uh, you know, that's where the, 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 the real um, shifts started to happen. And, you know, I can say now that, you know, I'm totally 100% in remission from that complex PTSD. All of that trauma, that body-held trauma of that infant that was living in pure terror, uh, that's no longer there. It's gone. Um, it's amazing. What positive changes would you say have happened in your life, say, in, re- in relationships or just daily life in general, after taking this psychedelic recovery? <laughs> How long have we got? Um, <laughs> oh, a, lot, a lot more peaceful. Like, I know what peaceful is now. Um, you know, I can sit down and go to sleep fairly quickly <laughs> and fairly easily uh, and be relaxed. Um, the, the triggers and challenges that I used to hit, you know, many times a day, they're no longer there. Um, I find working um, so much easier. Uh, there's no drama um, in my relationship with Annette. It's changed totally in that all of a sudden the reasons why, because we've both been doing this journey, we've both done this journey together, um, the reasons why we initially got together have changed. And it's like all of a sudden the fabric of our initial relationship, which was around you know, the trauma, um, is no longer there. And you know, we're sort of sitting down looking at each other and say, who are you? She's sitting here now listening. Um, she's, uh, it's, it's changed it totally. I've still got a little bit of work to do around the anxiety mm-hmm. uh, in that. And it's in, in my relationship that that anxiety comes up um, in trusting a woman. And, you know, like I, I, I was just totally annihilated by, by a woman. And, you know, and I grew up with this um, misogynistic attitude that you know, women are dangerous. And mm-hmm. one of the probably one of the most powerful sessions that I did was getting rid of my own misogyny um, and uh, oh, that was such a relief. It was so deeply held that you know I had to sort of purge it out, vomit it out. And the therapist asked me, he said, "Is there blood in there?" And I said, oh, "I wouldn't be surprised because it felt like it come from my toes. It was just so tightly held." Like these are the sort of things that the um, MDMA in particular works with. MDMA, where they started trialing it as for couples therapy. Oh, back in the late 1950s. And mm. they're finding that it was actually really working. And I can see how it would work because Annette and I have done a couple of sessions together with it and can see how it, um, you know, it does, it really does work. But when the war on drugs was sort of brought in, all, you know, all this stuff and all the research and everything like that had to be destroyed. Otherwise, universities were threatened that, um, you know, they'd, they'd lose their funding if they anyway, you know, participated in studying this stuff in any way, shape or form. So, but that's all, that's all sort of, changing now uh mind medicine australia are sponsoring um changing the the laws to have this stuff uh not you know not free for all but have it made yep. legal yep. where therapists doctors gps whatever can actually pres- prescribe it so you know that's that's what they're trying to do they've still got hurdles um they've been uh, rejected a few times and each time they've been rejected it's with the proviso of we need more information and uh, you know earlier this year the federal government allocated 15 million dollars in research uh here in australia to to actually look at this so you know it's it's happening slowly but it is but it is actually you know starting to change and you know i'd say in the foreseeable future uh you know therapy this type of therapy will become uh not only legal but um a lot more uh, easily, you know, much more easily available. And uh, but also, too, uh, the question that needs to be asked, too, is if this stuff does come back in, is can therapy, uh, you know, keep up with it? Because it is a very, very different type of therapy to, you know, to the mainstream that um, is currently currently happening. So there's a lot of interesting things happening. It's actually quite exciting. So um be interesting to see where it goes. Did it feel good for you to start talking about these things when you started talking about all the experiences you had gone through? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of shame around it because, like, for me, as I said before, you know, I'm, <laughs> as conservative as I come, I was a farmer in Western Victoria, so, you know, as conservative mm. as it comes, um, never never used, never used drugs at all um, until, uh, you know, Ned said, well, why don't you come and do this session with me? And, uh, yeah, it took a long time for me to get over the shame, I reckon a year. 
um, of doing these types of sessions uh, before I was actually over the over the shame. And uh, you know, I have spoken a couple of times at different conferences and bits and pieces about it, and I found that to be very very therapeutic, very healing. And even now, having this conversation with you as well, it's it's a very positive thing to mm. to actually talk about. And uh, yeah, I will be talking about it um, definitely. Remembering back to before you took on the recovery, wh- what kind of things in your daily life were challenging now that you look back on it? Uh, pretty much everything. Um, this this controlled every single aspect of my life. Um, you know, I'd be my hobby is um, you know bonsai, miniature plants, and uh, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. And sometimes I'd be sitting there looking at them and enjoying them, um, and then all of a sudden this overwhelming fear sadness, um, a, a real burning sensation in my gut um, would, would just come out of nowhere. And then I'd, you know, I'd, I'd automatically start thinking negatively um, and not so much about the plants. I'd turn around and walk away, but I'd sit down and, you know, I'd start thinking negatively. I'm, you know, I'm a failure. This is what's happened. Um, you know, the fact that what mum did, um, you know, I took on that I'm wrong. Uh, I took on that I'm no good, that men are wrong and, you know, all of this sort of stuff that I can't trust women. And, you know, it was the ultimate sort of mind um, challenge to uh, try and have a normal life in that. And the way I did that was I built a, a, a floor um, over my trauma um, and, right, I start again and pretend it never happened. And that sort of worked, but probably back in the 90s, uh, 30 years ago, uh, I, it, I just fell over. You know, I was divorced and um, business liquidation, ended up in bankruptcy and, you know, a whole host of things happened and I could never understand why. And I think what this process has given me is an understanding why. And going back sort of, you know, I don't know it's only 15, 18 months ago before I started this, was just a constant feeling of heaviness, like a, you know, I'm carrying a backpack on me that's full of bricks. Um, and, you know, if I try and take it off, I can't. If I try to stand up. It's like trying to stand up standing on my coattails. You know, that sort of thing and just the negative talk that came out of that. And because the trauma happened at such an early life, I'd never known any different. I was able to build a sort of like a survival strategy that got me through day-to-day stuff but um you know long term i just i was collapsing i was collapsing inwards and you know my business liquidation um in horsham western victoria was a really good business good people good work good gear and i fell down i collapsed and i took the business with me and nobody else's fault but my own and you know looking back now and that was 12 years ago looking back there now I feel really sad that, you know, I had all the things that I wanted. Um, you know, I was in a, you know, I was married, I had three kids, you know, and the farm and all this sort of stuff. And it's just, it's just a constant fear that I'm going to, something's going to happen and something's going to happen to me that's not, not very good. And, you know, I lived in that constant fear that um, I was not going to make 40 years old. And, mm. you know, leading up to that, I was absolutely terrified. Um, and I reckon uh, that was probably a big part of why my marriage ended was that constant fear. I couldn't move. I couldn't sing. I had three, you know, beautiful, amazing kids. And I pulled back from them emotionally. A big part of what my mother did too was there was a lot of sexual abuse in that as well. And, uh, mm. you know, when my kids started to, you know, getting to the ages of four or five, I found I had to pull back emotionally from them purely and simply because I didn't understand what the terror was that I was carrying. That just real gut-wrenching fear was just so constant. And it just got to a point where I couldn't function anymore. I just I just stopped. And about 18 months ago, you know, like when Annette said, hey, come on, let's go and, come, come and do one of these with me, and which is what I did. And, uh, you know, I just hasn't hasn't looked back and I've learned how I've um, knuckled down under the trauma and the depression and what I did to myself to survive nobody else but you know the trauma what mum did was one part of it but the biggest part of it and the hardest part to deal with was what I'd actually done to myself those self-defeating beliefs the negativity 
um, you know, I'm not good enough or, you know, you're going to screw this up and, uh, you know, just all that sort of rubbish. And once I'd started the medication, I was able to actually start to see the trauma. And once I got the trauma out of the way, which took a fair bit, and I've still got pockets of trauma in me um, that, you know, every now and then they'll come out and I recognise what it feels like, so I just allow it to come out. And, um, you know, that's really um, gratifying, validating, I suppose, of my journey in this that now I can just, you know, I might be sitting on the couch watching a movie or something like that and all of a sudden I'll start tremoring or, you know, I'll feel something and I'll just say, okay, this is what's happening. And, you know, I'll just say to Annette, oh, okay, I'm, I'm experiencing that, you know, that first six months part of my life mm. at the moment. Well, oh, okay, cool. Um, that's all I need to say, and just allow it to, to 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 actually to actually happen. So the changes in the last twelve months, eighteen months, are huge, are extensive. Um, so much easier. Um, life is is enjoyable. There's not that heaviness. Um, you know, I'm much more present. You know, in my relate, well, mm. I am present mm. in my relationship with Annette. I mean, you know, because of her, her issues with her father, you know, she's had stuff that we've had to deal with. So we sort of got to the same point at the same time and sort of looking at each other and sort of thinking, well, okay, what do we need to do here and what's this like? And mm. it's just, you know, steady as she goes, gently, um, but also with awareness and understanding of where we've come from, but also, too, what we need to do and, most importantly, what we want to do. So it's been a, it's been one hell of a journey. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Graham Studholtz, who is sharing his journey with complex PTSD. How well do you think society understands PTSD? Very poorly. Uh, the type that I had, uh, mainstream psychology gets around mainstream therapies, about 5% remission. And I can see why. Um, and I think when the medication start becomes legal, there will be a steep learning curve on learning how to actually run the sessions with the, uh, with the medication. And they're not like a normal session where you go into a, an office, sit down, and um, you know, an hour later you walk out. It's, you, know, you want to allow a day and you've also got to have access to very, very good uh, therapy in integrating that afterwards as well. And that integration can also take long, as long as the actual session. It's very time-consuming. Um, it's not a quick fix. It's not take a tablet. And this is really, really important to point to make is that it's not just take a tablet and you're fixed. It's take a tablet, it opens the door, but you've still got to walk through that door. And it's really important that if you walk through that door that you've got, you know, very, very good and easily accessible therapy to support you in your integration. And that's that's what I've had. I live with Annette, who's a very, very capable therapist. We're both breathwork practitioners in the past, and the type of um, therapy and integration is the breathwork type uh processes and we found them that that's been very very useful we've obviously had to adapt in how to to, to use the medication but um we found that that's been very very uh very powerful and the main thing is that the it takes time and that's one of the things that mainstream therapy doesn't have is you know like there's an alarm that rings at 45 minutes and then again at 50 minutes and then you're out the door. Uh, doing medicine therapy, you can't do it in that space. You know, I've had sessions that have gone for nine or 10 hours. Um, mm. And, you know, if you, it's, and to be in a, a session space like that is actually, it's not cheap. Um, but when you're buying the process, I imagine in the future when you're buying the process that you're actually buying the package of the backup therapy and the actual um, access to that to that therapist as well. And it may be a combination of therapists too. There's one therapist that'll, that might be your GP that will prescribe the medication. You'll go to another therapist, sort of like a breathwork practitioner, where you'll take the medication and spend six or seven hours doing the process. And then there'll be another therapist that will sit with you and deal with the, the integration as well. Um, it's a big ask to have one therapist do the whole lot because it's mm -hmm. so so um, diverse. And this is one of the reasons why mainstream therapy really struggles with PTSD and um, uh, depression. Anxiety, not so much, but you know, particularly depression, the uh, reliance on antidepressants and also with PTSD. Um, it, it works for some, but it doesn't bring about remission. And 
these uh, psychedelic the psychedelic medicine and this is a great thing about what mind medicine are promoting is that these medicines and this is my experience these medicines bring about total remission not just you know partial or whatever and i mean total and mm. you know my trauma my ptsd came from uh was 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 created from my mother trying to kill me as an infant in the first few months of my life and 65 years later those fears and whatever are gone but by geez i tell you what they were they were real um i actually did a a, a session where i videoed um videoed recorded um the the actual unlocking of the 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 part one one particular episode with mum i nearly did die uh being suffocated by pillow and that piece um i was aware of it because i've done therapy around that before but I couldn't get to it, and I actually got to it in a um, MDMA psilocybin session, and that body reaction of releasing that moment, the trauma, actually got it on video, um, and I found that to be really healing. I've only watched it twice, I think, and just to actually see, you know, this 65-year-old mm. person reliving that trauma was very, very sobering, very healing, because um, I found that my experience of growing up in that environment was total denial. Nobody owned or admitted um, to what had happened. And uh, I found that to be probably more traumatic than the actual trauma. The trauma was cut and dried compared to the actual heaviness, the depression part of living every day with this uh, level of um, corruption, I suppose, and living with it every day, but not knowing or understanding or um, you know anything anything about it. So it was quite a um, you know quite a challenging challenging thing to deal with. It, but once once I actually started and learned to trust the process, the medicine, uh, you know, it just it just gathered momentum. And um, you know, and I, the therapist that I was actually doing the sessions with, um, he was he was actually quite challenged by some of the things that came out. Um, and I found that using an, another therapist to integrate, and I've got one, um, Patrick, he's been brilliant. And as, as I've unlocked and talked about these things in sessions, and there for a big part of last year, I was seeing him weekly. Mm. Um, this year, I'm only seeing him fortnightly. Um, I found the uh, having a therapist that understood this stuff, and he also did a fair bit of reading too to catch up and understand what it was and he's recommended some books to me to read as well which have been very very useful uh the whole process is it's not just take a tablet it's the whole process the integration and the, you know the intention i'm going to do this is is probably the most important thing the intention that i'm going to do this and i'm going to get through this is far more important than the actual medication the medication enables it but i've still had to walk through the you know i had to walk through the door and that door was pretty damn scary across the board when it comes to pdsd recovery and approaching pdsd what needs to change and how we approach it and how can we do that? Um, in my words, my words, PTSD is invalidated trauma and the type of therapy that is mainstream um, deals very poorly with trauma happenings in a child, like stuff that happens in early childhood. And this is not just with PTSD, this is with depression, this is with domestic violence, marriage breakdown, uh, sexual abuse, the whole, the whole gamut. Um, I don't think there's a, an easy answer. The easy answer is, okay, we need to seriously consider legalising, you know, the psychedelic medicines. Um, and, you know, MDMA was developed 110 years ago. So it's been around, it's proven. Uh, psilocybin is natural. Um, cannabis oil is natural. They've all got their, their strengths and their weaknesses. And I think accepting that these medications have a role to play uh, will greatly um, support mainstream psychology and actually dealing with it. If a person who's got really heavy PTSD or depression has one or two medicine sessions, when they go to their therapist, back to their mainstream therapist, they're in a very different place. They can talk about their um, trauma or their, their depression. Depression quite often comes from trauma. They can talk about that much more openly, in a much more body-centred way, and also get to the seat of what it is that, that's, 
that's tripping them up uh, get to that a lot more um, readily, easily, and also with clarity as well. So if I had to answer your question succinctly um, about what can mainstream therapy do, I think is legalise legalize the psychedelics. What would be the take-home from this interview you'd want people to remember the most? Um, I think probably that there is a way forward, that the war on drugs basically... Uh, has run its course and um, it's cost us a lot and that throwing out psychedelics um, because of the war on drugs has been a major step backwards and I think supporting um, Mind Medicine Australia and their push to legalise psychedelics would be a very, very positive step and I think that um, I would suggest have a good look at the war on drugs what it's about, what it actually means, and also the countries that have got a very different attitude towards it than what we have here. We're probably in the middle of the road and we're shifting, um, which is a good thing. And I think the federal government putting $15 million into research uh, beginning of this year was a, was a major indication that they're taking this seriously. So um, that would be, you know, my, my take-home medicine is that things are changing and just be aware that they're changing and to keep an open mind um, that there are a lot of people out there suffering with PTSD, and I mean really suffering, PTSD, uh, depression and anxiety, and that, you know, this is a, a major a major tool in unlocking the, the labyrinth of PTSD and, uh, and depression, um, a major, major tool in unlocking. And, uh, you know, the, the sooner it's legally available, the better. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today, Graham. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. My guest today was Graham Studholtz, sharing his complex PTSD story. Tune in next week where we speak with complex PTSD academic expert, Dr. Bethany Brand. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins. And all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.